Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. Once again, I appreciate you being here. I'd like to have you take your Bible tonight, and I want you to turn with me to Galatians chapter 6. Tonight's going to be Christianity in real life and how it works with caring for each other in relationships. So I'd like to have you look at Galatians chapter 6. We're just going to read verses 1 through 5, please, for you, and follow along with me as we look at this. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let's, let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you again as we conclude this day that you've given us, this Lord's Day, where we want to look at your glory and have your glory revealed in us and through us. Father, we cannot do any of this apart from you. We cannot bear any glory. The Holy Spirit within us is the agent that allows us to obey you and show forth your praises to this world. And I pray, Father, once again, that you might fill us with the Holy Spirit. Help us to understand what you're saying in this book. Help us to be able to speak it and help us to be able to hear it. And then, Father, that in everything we do, we would be desiring sharing these things and these messages with others. In your name we pray. Amen. Once again, I just want to remind you that the purpose of Calvary Baptist Church is not to impart knowledge. I'm not here to try to teach you. That's not my point. I don't think we ever should in this church teach someone else. We need to teach someone to teach someone to teach someone. This is a cyclical approach at Calvary Baptist Church. I don't have the responsibility of teaching God's Word. My responsibility is to teach you how to teach someone else God's Word. If it ends with you, I have not done my job. And unfortunately, I think that's what's taking place in most churches today. People like to hear it, but they don't know it once they've heard it well enough to be able to teach it to someone else. So that's why I want you to listen, and that's why I want you to take notes, not for the sake of you knowing it, but for the sake of you being able to teach someone else what it says. We're in Galatians chapter 6, and again, we're talking to brethren, people who are saved. This is a different subject completely than what we've been going over in the past. We're looking at the rubber meets the road Christianity, how it really applies in, in everyday life. But we're in Galatians talking about relationships with, un, with one another, bearing one another's burdens. How does it look in real life? What does it mean to be my brother's keeper? Obviously, we're not talking about physical brothers according to the flesh. We're talking about brothers and sisters in Christ. What does it mean to be my brother's keeper? Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, there are three cases that we're looking at today. The first case is the case of a sinning brother. Someone in the church has sinned. How do you respond to them? How do you relate to them? There is a huge difference with responding to them in rebuke. There's a huge difference in a rebellious brother, one who has rejected God's word, one who has chosen to disobey, and one who's been overtaken in a fault. This brother has not sought to rebel against God. This brother is different. He has sinned, that's no doubt, but every one of us, all of us have this in common. There's not one of us that escapes a day without sinning. And sometimes that sin affects others. Sometimes it affects us. Sometimes it affects our families. And what you want is to have someone in the church who cares enough about each other 
to bear that burden, to restore that person. The church needs restoration. It needs restoring brothers who will come alongside of a person and say, you know, I care enough about you that I'm concerned about something that you've done. Again, the idea of considering yourself is the fact, the fact is we all do this. All of us get overtaken in a fault. That's why we do it in the middle, in the, in the spirit of meekness. I think some people would rather translate this verse, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you are spiritual, club him. I think they would rather translate it like that. Just smack him. But that's not the point. Obviously, there is a time for discipline. There's a time of discipline, for instance, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll talk about that in a, in a little bit here. It says, if a man be overtaken in a fault, this is generic. It can be you, it can be me, and obviously it's true about me as well as you. If a man be overtaken in a fault, all of us are overtaken in a fault. This happens. The word fault, prolambano, We've, we've mentioned these verses before, so it may sound familiar to you, but pro lambano, lambano is one of the first verse, first words that you learn in Greek. It means to take or to receive. Lambano means I take or I receive. Pro lambano is to take upon or take to, take before. It's kind of like men, you understand, a man running for the touchdown and he's got the football and he starts premature celebrating. He starts waving his hands and starts slowing down and looking up at the jumbotron. In fact, I just saw this just the other day. This guy was celebrating, looking up at the jumbotron, and all of a sudden this guy jumps and tackles him and, and grabs his ankles. And he was so surprised, he didn't see that guy at all. And he was, had slowed down quite a bit because he wanted to, to celebrate when he, before he got into the end zone. But he didn't fumble, and it was just a lesson learned. But I, that is so true of people. You think you stand, you don't think you have any problems, you don't think the sin is approaching you, because I am spiritual. I have been doing very well. I've been in my Bible. I've been praying. That's not going to happen to me. Look up at the jumble patron and, and just kind of rejoice in, in the fact that God is providing for me. But this happens. It overtakes you. And that word, because I said lombano means to take or receive, the word overtake is a very good word, a very good translation of that. This sin has tackled you from behind when you didn't expect it. You weren't trying to rebel. You just felt like you didn't necessarily need to be watching or, or, or being warned or being cautious of, about this. Now again, in the case of a heretic, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, we are not talking about a heretic here in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. We're not talking about rebellious sin. It is sin, even though he calls it a fault in this passage. Again, 1 Corinthians 5, I told you about this, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. That sounds like clubbing him, very much like clubbing him. And in some ways, that is judgment, because this man knew it was wrong. This man was committing adultery with his father's wife, his stepmom. And again, that is, it is such a, a, a wrong thing, and the Bible so clearly teaches that's wrong. This man openly rebelled against God, and the punishment is, is fitting the, the crime in this case. But Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 is a little bit different. So what do you do if a man is overtaken in a fault in the church? How do you react to that? Are you your brother's keeper? To what extent? The word fault is very similar to falling. It is the same word that's used with Jesus in the garden when he falls on his face and prays. When Jesus falls on his face and prays, understand that is not talking about sin, but in this case, it is a fall. The person was overtaken in a fall. He was tripped up by something that was in front of him, and he has struggled in some area in his life. The passage says, He that is spiritual, restore such an one. Now, I'm saying that we're not talking about clubbing him, 
But the word that's used in this passage means to mend or to fit a broken bone. It is very clear that's one of the translations of this word here, to restore. It is to outfit, but it's also to mend, to mend a broken bone. Now you can imagine, if this man has fallen, if he has broken his leg, and it's our job to restore him, <laughs> you take that leg, and of course, I'm not going to set your broken leg. But if there is anyone who does that in the church, obviously, they're going to inflict pain. But they're not going to do it for the purpose of inflicting pain. They're doing it for the purpose of restoring this bone. So they may have to stretch it out, they may have to pull it, they may have to turn it, they may have to set this bone back in place. It may cause this man a lot of pain to do that. But they don't do it to inflict pain. There's a gentleness among this. There's a gentleness to, to pull it because what they're doing here is fixing it, not breaking it. They're setting the bone back into its proper position so that it can heal. And that's really the passage is talking about. A spiritual man in the church... No. Every one of us sins. Every one of us of, at times are spirit controlled. And so you have spiritual people and you have people who are sinning. And they're the same people. But the one who is, who is listening to Christ and Christ says you need to help that person. Consider yourself lest you be tempted. The same thing could happen to you. I understand it's happened to me in the past. They may have to set my broken bone in the future. So let me set their broken bone now. Having said that, it is true of pastors and deacons and Sunday school teachers. It's true of everybody. And boy, do you appreciate when someone comes alongside to set a broken bone. Something that can be a permanent problem if it's not cared for. And someone sees you being overtaken in a fault and they come up and say, say, Pastor, I noticed that you lost your temper or something with that person. I need to pray for you about that because that could really be a problem to you. Okay. I really need you to pray for me. And a pastor needs that just as much as everyone in the church to have someone come alongside of him because he also is overtaken in faults and he needs a broken bone. We must become restorers. The whole church must become restorers. Romans 14.1 him that is weak in the faith receive you, but not to doubtful di disputations. This does not say him that is wicked in the faith receive you. It says him that is weak in the faith receive you. That is a different approach. Everybody becomes weak at some point. They have not been in the Word of God enough. They have not had the nutrition they need spiritually. And they have weakness and they fall into weakness. There's jealousies, there's envies, there's, there's, there's murmurings, there's problems inside of the person. They've said something to hurt someone else. That happens. Friends, the church is made up of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the oil that brings about relief. It brings about healing. But I want you to understand there's going to be hurt in a church. The closer the church gets to each other, the more friction occurs. And if two people are not living with the power of the Spirit, they can cause damage among their relationship and among other people in the church. And it happens all the time. A church is not immune from problems. In fact, the closer you get to people, the more problems that exist. And you have people that leave the church because of hurt feelings. You don't want that to happen, but that happens because churches are not perfect. And the people within the church are not perfect. Heard a, a preacher one time say, say, has anyone met, met a perfect person? And this man says, he raised his hand, he says, you've met a perfect person? Well, I haven't really met him, but I've heard about him. He was my wife's first husband. <laughs> he says, well, anyway, forget it. Anyway, again, we go to the second point. He is the case of a burdened brother. Bury one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. This is the second case. The first one of, was of, in the case of a sinning brother, one who fell into error, fell into a fault. The second one is the case of a burdened brother. Bury one another's burden. And again, we're not all falling all at the same time, but everyone in this church is burdened. 
There's not a person in this church that doesn't have a burden. Burdens are part of the world. There are some things that are really heavy to carry. Now again, there's, there's two verses here. If you look again, verse, five every, man shall, or verse uh, 5, every man shall bear his own burden. Verse 2, bury one another's burdens. And people say, see what a contradiction that is. At one time it says, bury one another's burdens. And it says everyone should bear their own burdens. I want you to understand that there are two separate Greek words for the word burden. They're not the same. <coughs> the author is not using the same terminology. He is not saying the same thing, contradicting himself. The word, the first one, baros, means barometer, something weight, something heavy. Baros meaning weight, heaviness. And there are times when you have something heavy that you have to carry, whether it's cancer, whether it's a loss of a job, whether it's a major bill, maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's a son or daughter that's not living for the Lord. There's a heavy, heavy weight that you're carrying, and it's hard. I, uh, when I first came to the church here 32 years ago, there was a young deacon in this church. He was a little older than I was, but he was still young. And he would take me out to breakfast about once a week. And this guy was amazing, an amazing man. I was a youth pastor in the church. I was used to get, making about twice as much money as I was making with half the problems that I had. And I came to the church and I just couldn't seem to accomplish what, what the people expected me to accomplish. And he would take me out and I would get so frustrated with what was happening in my own life. And he would just talk to me and he would carry the burden. It was amazing. He could just like see right through me what was going on in my life. He would just know exactly what was, what, how he was feeling and he just knew how to pray for me. I'll just give you a quick story. We were out one time uh, having breakfast together, and this waitress came, and she was kind of short with us. And I didn't even notice it. you know. And, but he noticed it. He was very sensitive. And she came back, and he says, you know, I, I noticed that something's troubling you. Is there anything I can pray for you about? And, and that, I looked at him like, what? How did you notice that? She's only said like three words to us the whole time. You know, you want water or what? You know, it wasn't anything. And she, she just kind of broke down and she said, boy, I've been having a bad day. And I was, I was shocked that he could sense that in her. And he said, you know, I'd love to pray for you. And from that point on, <laughs> she came to us with this big smile on her face and, and bringing us water and just seemed like it would just changed her day completely. The fact that he could sense that. And feel what was going on inside of her. Incredible. John Schroeder was building a house in Duluth one day. And uh, I went there with another man to help him put trusses on his roof. <laughs> and these trusses were heavy. And this guy, of course, you know him. His name is Larry Orth. Larry um, was a bodybuilder. And the guy, I think, had benched like 550 pounds at one time. And so we had to pick up these trusses and bring them up or push, push them through, you know, the plates up onto the roof. And they're big trusses. And Larry grabs it in the middle. <laughs> he grabs the truss in the middle and I'm taking the end. Now, I don't care what you know about geometry. If someone grabs a truss in the middle, how much weight does the guy have at the end? <laughs> at the end, there's no weight at the end. If you're in the middle, there's absolutely zero weight at the end. <laughs> and so he grabs his truss and he lifts it up and I'm thinking, this is crazy. What am I even here for? This truss is heavy enough for two people and yet he grabs it in the middle. So I just got a kick out of that. Lifting up those trusses to John Schroeder. Think about this. In, in the self-sufficient culture we're in, just think how it's working. There's every person in this room has a weight that's greater than you can carry. And so someone comes up to you and says, hey, could you help with this burden? And your reaction is, no, I can't carry anyone else's burden because I have to carry my own burden and I can't even handle my own burden. My burden is greater than I can bear, so how can I help anyone else? They've got to carry their own burden because I have my own burden to carry. And I'm thinking, 
There's something wrong here. You can imagine what it would be like if the people in the church were not self-sufficient and someone would come along with them and help them with their burden so that they would have less burden so they could help someone else with their burden. And instead of everybody trying to hold and carry their own weight, people were helping so that we're always two or three people carrying every weight. And no one had to carry 100% of their weight because my weight is not nearly as great when someone else carries it, which gives me an opportunity to carry someone else's weight, which gives them an opportunity to carry someone else's weight, which gives them an opportunity to carry someone else's weight. But when we get to this self-sufficient thinking, no, I don't need your help. I can handle my problems myself. I don't need you to come over. I don't need you to help me with the car. I don't need you to help me with my bill. I will take care of it somehow. And oh, is it a burden. And I can't even share it with anyone because they would think I'm really bad if they knew the great burden that I have. There's something wrong there, right? Because if you had a church full of people who care for each other's burdens, it would lessen the load of every single person in the church. And wouldn't that be something? If no one had to bear, bear the burden that they weren't able to carry because it's greater than they're, than, than they're able to hold. Now, this was a cartoon years and years ago, but you can imagine these two goldfish in this blender. And the one goldfish saying, I can't stand the tension. There's nothing wrong with being in a blender. I think it says goldfish food here, fish food here on this thing. It's, it's, it's great. There's fish food. <laughs> and as long as no one pushes a button, there's no problem. <laughs> you know, you're, you're missing the joke here. <laughs> I don't know. Well, the, the last time I saw this cartoon years ago, this one goldfish was oblivious to the problem. He was just swimming around like nothing wrong, man. This is great. He's in a goldfish bowl. He's having a great old time. The other one could see it's plugged in. <laughs> <laughs> and this is potential energy. This is definitely a problem. And, he, and, and the stress was greater than he could possibly bear. And nothing was happening, but it was still greater than the stress he could bear. Again, the, the, the case of a burdened brother. If a man think himself to be something, and listen, in context, in context, I have the sufficiency to carry my own burden. I don't need any help. What is the law of Christ? Again, bury one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Remember, Jesus Christ three times gave you a commandment, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. And he says it three times in the book of John. Again, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. One thing I want you to understand is in the case of a burdened brother, it says if a man thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. First of all, number one, he's lying to himself. He is not something. And number two, the truth is that he is nothing. Wait a second, nothing. He is nothing. Without Christ, he is nothing. And again, for without me, you can do nothing. We were designed... Huh. Boy, I'm missing a lot of slides here. I didn't get, get them in here the way they're supposed to. We are designed... You can see a bow and an arrow. And you have a bow. This bow is perfectly curved. It has potential of 60 to 80 pounds of force on that arrow. It has a good string... It is a great bow, but if it has no arrows, if there are no arrows, what good is it? 
The bow has absolutely no purpose without arrows. And again, you can picture, you can picture a real expensive brand new BMW sitting at a gas pump and that BMW cost $56,000. But if it has no gas in it, if there's no gas in it, it has absolutely no purpose. Now, when I say that, God has created us with eyes, with ears, with nose, with all kinds of opportunities to serve Him. But if we are not connected to Jesus Christ, we have no purpose. We're nothing without Him. Because the way we are created, like a bow and arrow, we are not created to be alone ever without Christ. And yet mankind separating the BMW from the gas pump, what are they doing? It may look good, it may smell good, it may feel good to sit in it, but you lose the entire purpose for which it's created. And when God has created mankind to be connected, to be in fellowship with God, and we separate God from man... We lose all of the purpose for which that man is created. And I'm telling you, that is the 100% problem that young people are going through today when they go to college and they reject Jesus Christ, they reject God. They lose track of any purpose for which they were created. And their life goes from being created by God to bring glory to Him, which changes lives to something that looks good, <laughs> that can feel good, that can taste good. What? It is crazy because there's absolutely no purpose when you disconnect connect man from God. There's absolutely no purpose in your creation. What a wasted life. <laughs> we number of illustrations having to do with canoes right now. Um, I, I'll just share with you a couple illustrations here. First of all, there was one, we, I used to take groups of, of youth up to the Boundary Waters. Had a great time. Discipleship training, it was wonderful. Logan does it now. Wilderness trips, it's a great, great ministry. I know Gene has done this a lot in the past. But one of the guys in our youth group, years and years ago, he was an accident waiting to happen. The guy was an accident waiting to happen, and he put this canoe on his back. I told you this story once before, but he was running, running, running over this hill in this portage. It was straight uphill and straight downhill, and there were a lot of rocks, and he was running. And I just had a few seconds to say to him, Matt, don't run! But he was going too fast. It didn't matter. So the front of the canoe is going up and down like this. <laughs> And you can imagine running with a canoe on, on your shoulders, and then the front of the canoe drops too far, and it catches a rock and stops abruptly, right now, while you're running, <laughs> carrying the canoe. Does that sound dangerous to anybody? <laughs> this guy was running, and the canoe stops, and <laughs> he was on a hill. So nice thing about it is he went right over the embankment, <laughs> and rolled over with his canoe down this 10-foot embankment, and the first thing he says, I'm all right. <laughs> yeah. Man, this is crazy. To be running with a canoe and have that canoe go over the embankment, and it's only funny now because he didn't get hurt. Not seriously, anyway. Just, just kind of his pride got hurt. But you look up there in the boundary waters when you're canoeing up there, and, and you, see, you see rocks that your canoe hits. You hit that rock, but if you look at it, it's filled with aluminum. The rock is covered with aluminum. You were not the first person to hit that rock. And you go there and you'll, 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 you'll look at it and say, I tripped over that rock. You know something? You were not the first person to trip over that rock. You were not the pers first person to trip over that log. You were not the first person to fall down this embankment. Well, maybe a map might, might have been, because <laughs> that's kind of strange. But anyway... The, the case that we're talking about here of a burdened brother is this is so common. 
It is so common. Every single person. Oh, here are the verses I wanted to share with you. A new commandment I've given to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you love one another. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. These things I command that you love one another. God is really concerned that we show love to people, that we show love to our brothers, and that they see it and they know it. And a self-sufficient society does not allow a brother to show that kind of love toward us. There's the, the bow in the BMW, so I'm getting caught up here. Galatians 6, 5, every man shall bear his own, own burden. This is the third point, then, the case of individual responsibility. Galatians 6, 5, for every man shall bear his own burden. Uh, Phillips translate this verse, every man must shoulder his own pack. Once again, I'm taking you up to the boundary waters again, to one of the largest, longest uh, portages, it's 180 rods. It's over a half mile. A rod is about 320 rods. A mile is 320 rods, so it's, it's over a half mile. And you understand, if you have to take the trip, 180 rods with a canoe, and then come back and get your backpack, you have to take that trip three times. Three times over a half mile, that's over a mile and a half that you have to take it. If you have to do it five times, that's over two and three quarter miles. That's a long time. In other words, if you have to go with your canoe, come back and get a pack, go come back and get someone else's pack, that's five trips, which is about two and three quarter miles. Can you imagine how much walking that is? That's a lot of walking. We, uh, when we were up there in the Boundary Waters, this 180-rod portage, I was the first time taking a youth group of youth, youth up there, men up there, boys, young, old, young men up there, and 180-rod portage, I put an 80-pound backpack on and then took the canoe and put it on my shoulders and I started walking. Now, here's the dilemma. I didn't realize the dilemma until I started walking. The dilemma is this. I can't stop. Because if I stop, I don't care how much I'm hurting, I don't know if the youth behind me are going to pass me up. And they, with their pack on and their canoe on, if they're going to act like I'm, well, a sissy, let's say, you know. So I can't stop. And now I don't know whether they're dying back there or not. I have no clue of that. All I know is I can't stop because I'm the youth leader and I'm in front with a canoe and a backpack and I'm dying I've got to go over a half mile carrying this canoe and this 80 pound pack. And now for the first hundred yards, it wasn't bad. But then your spine begins to be compressed. And you start to get in physical pain. And you keep going just because you know that if you stop and they keep going, this is going to be really embarrassing. So you can't stop. So finally, at about little over a quarter mile, maybe even further than that, close to, to the end, you can't take it anymore. And you throw the canoe off and you fall on the ground and you're about dying. And all of the kids behind you let out this groan and they're so mad at you. <laughs> they're so angry that you're trying to kill them by making them carry a backpack and a canoe on one trip up this portage. They're so angry. <laughs> Because they're, they've been dying for a quarter mile, but they wouldn't say anything because you're their youth pastor and they can't say that. So, it's a strange dilemma. When we were up in, up in the, the Quetico, we had a one mile portage and there were, we had a girls with us and the girls couldn't carry their canoe. So you had to go one mile with your canoe, then you had to come back and get their canoe one more mile and then go one more mile with their canoe. Three miles, two of them carrying a canoe. That is one long portage. I just want you to understand, and just in closing here as we close, there are some burdens when the Bible says every man shall bear his own burden. There are some burdens that you cannot carry. You may have a son or daughter that's sick, and they're throwing up, and you wish that sickness would come upon you, and you could be sick, and they could be healthy. But you can't do it. You can't carry that burden. Someone may have cancer and they may be dying. It's appointed unto man once to die and you cannot carry that burden. You can't carry their sin. Every man will appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body. You cannot shoulder that burden. 
There is a personal responsibility that every one of them have. Everyone in this world has. And you can't shoulder that. But there is one who can. The psalmist writes, For my iniquities are gone over my head as a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me. But you read this, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and He shall sustain thee. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved. There is one who can carry the burden of cancer. He can carry the burden of sickness. He can carry the burden of death. He came to this earth to die on the cross to carry that burden. There is nothing that you're going to go through that he can't carry. That he can't lift some of that weight, some of that burden that you're going through. We are connected to him. And when we are connected to him, he gives us a burden that he asks us to carry. It's too great for us. But then he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And he will never suffer the righteous to be moved. You can cast your burden on the Lord and he'll sustain you. First Peter 5, he cast all your care upon him for he cares for you. And it's something you learn. Yes, we have to bear, carry those, those burdens. No one else can carry them for us. But God didn't design us to be independent. He designed us to be connected with, with Christ. And with that, he will carry every burden you have. Once again, we want to thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask him, that he might be your savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today. 